water. It covers 71% of the earth and we have 1.3 billion cubic kilometers of the stuff. That's equivalent to 170 billion liters per person. So why do one in nine people lack access to safe drinking water? Not only that, future accessibility of fresh water sources is becoming more and more uncertain due to increased droughts, shrinking glaciers, and increasing population size. Melting glaciers are causing sea levels to rise, leading to a phenomenon called saltwater intrusion, where seawater contaminates our fresh groundwater, making it too salty to drink. All of these things are contributing to the global water crisis. Hi, I'm Seb. And I'm Clara, and we're researchers at the University of Manchester studying graphene membranes for water treatment applications. Membranes are ubiquitous and they are a really crucial component of many complex physical processes. There are membranes in our cells that regulate the transport of nutrients inside and out. There are membranes in hydrogen fuel cells that regulate the transport of protons and electrons. And of course, there are membranes used for the separation and purification of vital resources like water. So we have ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, and reverse osmosis technologies, which enable us to even treat seawater turning it into safe drinking water for everyone. To produce clean drinking water, you need to remove all of the contaminants that are contained within it. In the case of river water, this can be microorganisms, bacteria. In the case of seawater, there's a large amount of salt. And it's really crucial that using membrane technology, such as reverse osmosis, you can remove all of these contaminants, making sure the water is completely safe to drink. The word osmosis might ring a bell back from high school biology. It's a process by which molecules of a solvent tend to pass through a semi-permeable membrane from a less concentrated solution into a more concentrated one. Reverse osmosis is the opposite. Water moves from a high concentrated solution to a less concentrated solution. It's the opposite of what happens spontaneously in nature, so you've got to put energy into the system to make it happen. In reverse osmosis, you do this by applying a high pressure, so you're forcing the water molecules through the filter and the salt molecules can't fit, so they're stuck and left behind. But to generate this pressure, you need a lot of electricity. And is this environmentally sustainable? CO2 emissions from desalination is expected to rise to 400 million tonnes of carbon equivalents by 2050. And also, desalination produces a brine which contains contaminants which could be harmful for marine life. There are four main characteristics of a membrane that are really important to consider when you design new materials for membrane applications. The first is the selectivity. This is how efficient a membrane is at separating one species from another, i.e. salt from water. The second important characteristic is flux or permeability. This is how quickly water is able to pass through the membrane. If you have a low permeability material, it means that you need more surface area, more membrane area to treat the same amount of water and this increases your costs. The third most important characteristic is fouling propensity. All membrane processes suffer from fouling. This process is the accumulation of unwanted species that stick and attach to the membrane surface, reducing the flux and potentially affecting the permeability as well. Over time, you will need to clean or even replace your membrane. And so by developing materials that have low fouling propensity, i.e. that are resistant to this attachment of foulant molecules to the surface, you can enable longer lasting membranes, reducing operational costs and improving the economics of your process. The fourth characteristic is cost. Membrane processes typically require very large areas of material. So you need to be able to produce this at scale with a low cost. Some membranes cost between 10 and $100 per square meter. And if you're using very niche materials that are much more expensive than that, it's not gonna be economically viable to use this as a membrane process. This is really important when using new nanomaterials in the design of these processes. Because graphene is atomically flat, water is able to pass over its surface without experiencing any friction. This enables highly efficient membranes to be produced, where the permeability is increased. In addition, by stacking these graphene flakes on top of each other, it's possible to tune the, the spacing between them. 
and this is the basis of the selectivity of the membrane. You can tune it so that water can pass through, but other molecules like salts and heavy metals are unable to pass through. One 2D nanomaterial of particular interest for water treatment applications is graphene oxide. It's similar to graphene, but it contains oxygen groups, and these oxygen groups are hydrophilic, meaning they attract water. When you stack graphene oxide flakes on top of each other, these oxygen groups serve a secondary purpose. They produce channels, or nanocapillaries, that enable water to pass through. When you combine this with the atomic scale flatness of the graphene domains, you get very, very high permeability of water and low friction transport. Furthermore, you can chemically tune these oxygen functional groups so that you can control the despacing, that's the spacing between the flakes, to make it larger or smaller, depending on what kind of application you're interested in. If you make the despacing larger, it means your selectivity goes down, but your permeability goes up. Similarly, if you make them smaller, your selectivity goes up, but your permeability goes down. Membranes is all about finding the sweet spot between selectivity and permeability. In addition, the hydrophilic property of graphene oxide means that water tends to cling to it, preferentially to other contaminants. And this is the basis of its anti-fouling properties, meaning it's much easier to clean and potentially reduces the operational side of, of maintaining the membranes. Hopefully that's given you a bit of inspiration on how you can use graphene membranes and also what the major challenges are in membrane industries. But there are some new processes to treat water that are becoming feasible thanks to graphene oxide membranes. And to show you this, we need to head over into the lab. Here in the lab, we're studying a process called membrane distillation. And as its name suggests, it's a mixture of membrane and distillation processes. However, normally when you want to evaporate water at one atmospheric pressure, you need to heat the water up to 100 degrees Celsius. But with membrane distillation, you only need to heat it to about 30 to 80 degrees Celsius. This is really important because it means that you could potentially use waste heat that's already available in an industrial process or just low-grade energy sources to power a desalination process. This will ultimately reduce the amount of CO2 emissions associated with desalination. So here we have a membrane distillation system. This process operates on fundamentally different principles to conventional pressure-driven membrane processes. Rather than applying a high pressure to the feed water, it actually operates on a difference in vapour pressure. This is normally set up by a temperature difference. So on one side it's hot or slightly heated, on the other side it's a lower temperature. And crucially, the difference here is that the membrane is not hydrophilic, as in the case with reverse osmosis, it's actually hydrophobic. What that means is that the membrane repels liquid water. So only water vapour is able to pass from this side of the membrane through to the other side where it's condensed and collected, leaving all of the salts, heavy metals and other impurities on the feed side of the membrane. The separation mechanism in this process is not based on the size of the pores in the membrane. In fact, in this case, the pores are over 100 times bigger than salt ions. It's based on the change in phase from liquid to vapour. And the surface tension of the water, combined with the hydrophobic property of the membrane, means that only vapour is able to pass through, keeping all of the contaminants in the liquid. One advantage of this is that you can go to higher concentrations than conventional pressure-driven membrane processes allow. In conventional pressure-driven processes, the more concentrated the water gets, the higher the osmotic pressure. This means you keep having to apply more and more pressure in order to push the water through the pores of the membrane. In this case, the vapour pressure difference is much less sensitive to changes in concentration. And so you can keep extracting water up to the point where you can actually crystallize the valuable minerals from within it. And that's what we have here with our crystallization vessel. This enables new capabilities that conventional membrane processes aren't able to achieve. 100% water recovery and the recovery of valuable minerals. This capability feeds into the idea of a circular economy where waste products become valuable components. This enables end users to reduce their costs on buying new chemicals in that are then disposed of. Instead, with technology like this, you can recycle it all. But there are some problems in membrane distillation that's limiting its commercial success. These are low flux, fouling, and long-term stability issues like poor wetting, which we mentioned earlier. Using graphene membranes can increase the flux, reduce fouling through its anti-fouling properties, 
and also increase the long-term stability. There are, there are different ways to make graphene membranes. One method is to make graphene coatings, so you have just flakes of graphene stacked on top of the membrane. And this can be achieved via methods like vacuum filtration, where you use a vacuum to suck an aqueous solution of graphene oxide through a membrane and then leaving the graphene oxide on top. Or you can achieve this by spray coating. You spray coat the graphene oxide directly on top of the membrane. We might instead want a membrane composite where the graphene is blended and mixed into the polymer membrane itself. This leads to them being more robust and also having higher flux when compared to membranes without the graphene. These methods that we've just shown are great for researchers to make membranes on the small scale. And this is how you make membranes on the large scale. We're in the Graphene Engineering Innovation Centre and behind me is the Mathis line capable of making one metres of graphene membranes per minute. It works in the same way that we saw in the lab. The polymer membrane solution containing graphene is poured onto a surface. The casting blade is set at a specific thickness and pushes the material to form a thin membrane. The membrane then passes to a water bath, but this time we're dealing with a thousand litres of water. The membrane then leaves the water bath and is dried before being wound into modules. This machine could also be used to form graphene oxide coatings. A ready formed membrane is used as a support material and the graphene is coated on top. This means the material can go straight to the dryer bypassing the phase inversion stage. While you may be creating a hypothetical business plan, I want you to know that these things exist where we can scale up and make graphene membranes for commercial purposes. It's important to consider this and to know that the products you design today could be made at large scale tomorrow.